It's, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to be in this room. It's always the uh, investor, uh, investor lounge. It's always nice to be able to speak to a group of peers and colleagues and, and friends. So it's, very, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all and to have you all on this panel today. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, let's take a moment maybe to, uh, for you to introduce yourselves to the audience before we jump into uh, risk and economic turmoil, which <laughs> Uh, Minoush Abdel Megid, I'm founding partner uh, and CEO of uh, Mizan. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Omar Radwan, uh, Chief uh, Risk Officer uh, for the group uh, in CI Capital. And um, I'm, a FRM and a CFA, so um, risk management is uh, very relevant to me now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I enjoy very much the last two panels, and I think we can complement on that, you know, as we go. Um, I'm Panos Kedikidis. I'm a professor of innovation and technology and a business angel investor. I'm a member of the board of the European Business Angel Network, and also I'm the founder of the Hellenic Business Angel Network. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, risk management during economic turmoil is never a, an easy panel, and normally, um, uh, I'm never in the moderator seat, but this is definitely one where I think I'm very lucky to be in the moderator seat. And uh, we're joined by a group of uh, wonderful um, experts who can share with us some of their perspective on how to manage risk during those difficult times. So we're, there's a lot to say about risk. So what we're going to try and do is think about risk from what we want to invest in and what we've already invested in. And each one should have a different treatment, but maybe we can start with how to think about risk in technology companies from Omar. Um, let me start by talking about risk management in general. Um, risk management is something that uh, should be the focus of all investors. Unfortunately, we just heard from the last panel that in good times, uh, risk takes a sidestep and in bad times risk is elevated and becomes uh, one of the most important things that we look at. So I think that what we need to do when we talk about risk management is that we deal with it as if it's something that is there. Uh, there is no investment without risk management and uh, there is no return without uh, some type of risk. Uh, and uh, the simplest form of looking at it is uh, the more risk there is the more return there is, but we always need to be aware of the types of risk that you're getting into. And we always need to be managing that type of risk, uh, taking care whether uh, that risk is acceptable so that we can take it, or it's not acceptable so that we need to deal with it one way or the other. So let me build on that. So in the last two years, everybody was very excited, everybody was spending a lot of money, everyone was investing a lot of, a lot of money, and as you mentioned, uh, risk was an afterthought. So now, all of a sudden, everyone is trying to manage risk in hindsight. What advice would you have for many of us in the room who were, um, let's say, casual about risk, and all of a sudden have become uh, a lot more formal about it? How can we work backwards to, to sort of protect some of the investments that we've made? in times like this? Uh, most of the investors have uh, a due diligence uh, exercise that they are very proud of and every one of us has his own uh, due diligence questionnaire, if you can say. And uh, this questionnaire, we start uh, using it at the beginning uh, of uh, the investment at the onset when we are sitting with this uh, new investor after the, they pitch to us their idea. And then we forget that this is an ongoing thing that we need to do all the time. So our uh, due diligence questionnaire needs to be uh, on top of our uh, exercise, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but very close to that. It's something that we need to be looking at uh, all the time. Why? Because simply, uh, life is giving us a lot of changes every single day. So uh, the questionnaire that was valid last week is not necessarily valid this week. I think we've all learned that uh, the hard way. But being and coming from Egypt, this is something that we've seen once, twice, and three times before. So we should be, by now, uh, used to that and used to how to deal with that. 
And uh, for that, I, I, my, my two cents on, on, on what we need to do is that we really need to be focused on uh, risk management as an exercise in the investee companies that we're looking at. They, uh, risk management is not an easy thing um, to be doing uh, when you're a startup with uh, very few people and you're uh, bootstrapping or you're uh, cutting costs or, or looking at uh, basically m m more interested in uh, growing rather than uh, looking at uh, whether the company will be profitable at the end of the tunnel or not. Uh, like the last panel has shown us. Uh, what we need to do there is that convincing all these investee companies that risk management is something that is the um, responsibility of each and every one of uh, those who are uh, in the management team or in the employees of that particular startup. So if risk management becomes part of what they do on a daily basis, uh, you become more comfortable. And for now, when you look at, with hindsight, about how you can do to salvage some of your investments, is that you introduce that as, a, uh, as, as, as something that you need to be looking at all the time and talking to them about, because uh, it is very easy now when you are in dire straits, I should say, that you take bigger risks rather than smaller risks. And bigger risks are okay if they are calculated and if they are taken in the right direction and at, at the, again, if they are understood and they are quantified. But if it is just taking risk for the sake of taking one last dive, whether uh, we make it or break it, then you need to be aware of that and may, need to be uh, willing to, to, to take that dive with them. So th there are two very useful pieces of information here that are very tangible that we can take home. Number one, regularly assess risk in your companies. Number two, when you are taking a risk, be very aware what is the risk you are taking. You take it intentionally. You take it consciously and you're aware of it. So let's go uh, into sort of thinking about new investments. We'll start from the early stage and then come back to the later stage. So Panos, how has the current climate changed how you think about new investments? Uh, we had the COVID and we had, you know, panels like this to discuss, you know, what we should do. We, should, uh, we had three choices, business as usual, the second one to be very selective on your investment, and the third one, pause. Okay, so we came now again and we have again the same dilemma. Uh, so what we have done, we had this two months ago with our network and we asked, you know, colleagues from all over the world, you know, what, how they are doing. So uh, we ask them this basic question, okay, what are you doing now? Are you opposing or, you know, business as usual and so on? And allow me if you, you know, I had some comments, you know, that I received back, you know, with my uh, friends and colleagues from all over the world. And of course, there is not a common thing. Depends, of course, at what stage is the business angel, because we have super angels, we have, you know, people that, let's say that on average, because we heard here, you know, people who have, you know, 50s, you know, on the portfolio, 25, but we say in Europe 10 is okay, you know, you know, because we are not looking for the super angels, and as we say, the tickets, you know, in, uh, in the European Business Angel Network is about 25,000, you know, uh, uh, euros. Now. So some people, they said, when, we, when I asked this question, they said, okay, yes, business as usual, as usual, and let me connect it to the previous one, but valuations are coming down, being negotiated much more carefully. Another view, someone else said, okay, at lower valuations and focus on customer acquisition, you know, cost. You know, many people, they talk about the unit economics here, that is very true. Someone else said, okay, because best startup portfolios were created during economic turndown, this is very important to remember, also when internal rate of return in SP500 you know, companies in 2018 was minus 38, the vintage of VCs and private equity portfolios created during the time showed plus 61 IRR. So usually, and many people they said in the previous panels, it's not worth saying that now, it's also a good time you know, to invest. But with all the things that they said, okay, be, uh, what we say usually, the business angels, some people, they say they 
do the, they take the risk because if you don't take the risk you will be a professor all your life okay so i can criticize myself as a, as an academic you know professors they never take any risk so we have to take a risk but we don't go to casinos it's a calculated risk with these two great ingredients now that I have it as a takeaway. I can take it back home. Thank you very much for the input. So this is how I think we should approach it. So talking to many people, and we have two webinars, one in November and one in December, to follow up on this by inviting people, one from Europe and one network and one from the United States, in order to discuss and see what they are doing so we can learn. Because events like this, like I was here in the last two, you know, they make you do your benchmark. Where are you standing? When you can do back, when you go back Monday morning in your office, what will be your next investment? Unfortunately, and I will stop with this because professors, they talk too much. Even though we have, you know, so many professors worldwide, if we have, you know, best VC funds and so on, we still are very low on success rate and we are doing something wrong. So we have to see our business model. We have to be more critical about ourselves with the comments that my friend here did already now and others in the previous panels. That's my view. So keep investing. This is a good time. It's an opportunity, but don't be reckless. Be more cautious, be more calculated. Do your homework better and more deeply. What about later stage, right? So I actually want to go back to the title of, the, of this panel. It's risk management in, during economic turmoil. And uh, adding to what a uh, professor has just said, I think we, there's a lot of opportunity in economic turmoil. And statistics and data confirm that a lot of private equity and later stage investors and funds uh, with vintage years during an economic downturn perform much better than uh, funds that are established and incorporated and begin start investing during an upturn. It's because a lot of investors are risk averse, um, capital is scarce, usually sometimes interest rates starts going up, uh, so it's more expensive to leverage, etc. And then you can, you can pick and choose better companies, better uh, entrepreneurs and founders of these companies. And you have also time to reflect because there's sometimes a panic in the market, there's less com competition on transactions and deals, etc. So when you go through all, all of that, you're able to assess um, investment opportunities and be able to identify the alpha. Um, we're all fund managers, so we manage risks on a daily basis. It's part of our job. To, you manage a fund, so you're really managing risks. Risks of the portfolio and risks of uh, the underlying assets, the companies within your portfolio. And there's so much that uh, needs to be done, and I think it's a little bit different with uh, venture capital uh, than in private equity. In private equity, we have to identify the risk ahead of actually thinking of the investments. And we have to uh, calculate the risk and understand how can we mitigate these risks. There's some risks you can't mitigate that are linked to the economy because there's no control. But there's company-specific risks and investment-specific risks that you need to identify certain mitigants to be able to address them. And if you, if, and if you can't address these, uh, these risks, you're better off not undertaking the, the investments, especially risks that are very specific to um, a certain uh, investment. I think going forward, and maybe it's, um, it's actually suicidal to be saying that, uh, in, in, it's, in, it's in, safe. It, it, These are all colleagues and I friends. Think, this yeah. is so I, I think lunch. that going forward, uh, growth earnings is, is very important. Controlling operational costs is, is even more important. I'm talking about later stage. Um, phasing out capex and expansion is also important because capital has become more scarce. Everyone needs to prioritize. Investment managers need to prioritize, and the companies themselves need to prioritize. You cannot be doing exactly what you've been doing in the past two years. You need to rethink. Uh, you need to rethink ex regional expansions. You need to even rethink, as a fund manager, certain sectors 
and certain industries and, and, and watch them from afar and see how they're going to develop over the course of the next couple of months to one year and then maybe go back and, and, and do these investments. So some people would argue, just like you said, that if, if, if you're a fund manager and your vintage is in a year during a recession, you tend to perform better um, because there's less competition, because you get your pick of which companies are the best companies. Um, some would also argue that as, co as a company, if I can convince my investors to give me more cash, I can beat out the competition, spend very aggressively, acquire market share, and be in a significantly better position post-recession. So where, where do you find the balance between the people who tell you to know, spend more, do a land grab, versus watch your operational expenses, reduce your burn, um, manage your capex? What is a healthy balance between these two approaches? I think it would it, it depends and it's a case by case basis. So um, cash is scarce and cash in turmoil is king, and it's a buyer's mar market. Um, it's um, it's it's very difficult to be actually um, addressing this question to someone from the private equity um, um, side because for us it's about earnings and it's about generating higher margins rather than burning cash. So if we would look at a company that's actually burning a lot of cash, we wouldn't touch it at this stage. Maybe it's more suitable for earlier stage investors. But the, the point is, we don't know uh, when this economic downturn will, will, I mean, when will we come out of it? So. So long as you don't have visibility, the wisest thing to do is actually make sure that you have some dry powder, uh, you save for a rainy day, as they say, and, and, and this, is, this, this also applies at a fund manager's level. You need to slow down the pace that you're undertaking investments, also look at the earnings and the, and, and the profitability and, and the quality of assets because it's extremely important to be looking at the assets that will be generating the cash flow for you as a fund manager and definitely as um, an entrepreneur and a CEO of the company. If you, if you have to make expansions because it's, it's, um, it's, you're, you're opportunistic and it's a very uh, golden opportunity, make sure that it's the right expansion in the right direction with possibly, um, um, I mean, I don't know, you're not overspending, there's not cost overrun, you can, you can leverage some of it, you can blend finance. There's a lot of innovative financing out there that actually supports company during an economic downturn that you can, that you can dig into and, and explore. So let's take this concept of uh, international expansion. Think of um, many companies in Egypt, like uh, in the previous panel was saying, the revenues are in EGP, everything is coming in from EGP, We've, we're getting back-to-back -back devaluations for the last four years, it's recession, my fund managers and investors are telling me not to expand, but I'm desperate for US dollars. Expansion is uh, one of the ways to um, diversify your revenue streams. So uh, it could be uh, looked at as uh, one of the ways uh, to uh, manage your risks. So um, in downturn, uh, it is normal for you to start looking at other markets that are doing slightly better than your own market. But we have to remember that uh, the black swans of, of, of the past are, are not that black anymore, or I would say that the pond is now uh, not, doesn't have only one black swan. The pond has many black swans and white swans. It's, uh, so so the, the fact that the, the panel title is risk management during economic turmoil, the question is when would that turmoil end? Uh, a certain type of turmoil starts today and another type starts tomorrow and another type starts after tomorrow. So um, the first turmoil ends, uh, a fourth turmoil has started. We are living in this uh, VUCA world where uh, uncertainty is uh, the name of the game. And because of that, uh, we have to be always looking at uh, risk management. Diversification is one of them. Uh, looking at uh, other revenue streams is, is definitely key. Um, in Egypt and EGP, when we talk about Egypt in particular, currently we do have an opportunity. Uh, and it, I think it's a, it's a humongous opportunity. 
and that is the fact that our being EGP is lower means that our products are much cheaper. So now maybe uh, not only go to other markets to open up business there, but to uh, basically uh, find markets where you can produce in Egypt and export. So exporting should become easier. So, Panos, let's think about, so we've talked about new investments, right? Pause straight ahead or um, uh, 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 pause business as usual or what was the third one? Be selective, right? So that's when we're thinking about making new uh, investments in, in times that are chaotic, right? So you have a portfolio, you've already made several investments, your network has made thousands of investments. I can't pause the decision, right? Um, how do I work with my portfolio to manage risk? Okay. Again, because I like numbers, and I believe that uh, we had a debate if it's an art or science. I think it's art mostly, and that's why you need empathy, you know, to when you talk, you know, to your founders and all these things, that we should be also very careful. All these things that we discuss here are important, but people at the end, it's, we have to go age to age, like human to human, okay? Because I like to invest to B2B, but now I invest mostly human to human now. Going back to your question, I think, and also from my personal, we shifted, they were, okay, there is not a formula, there is not a cookbook. So that's why I'm talking to people like you and the people that are, so I can learn, and usually what I say, you are the smartest in the room, change the room. That's why I'm here today, okay? So in order to pick up these things so I can improve 2% my success rate, so usually what we're doing, I shifted a little bit my investments on sectors. I went to areas like agro that I don't know much about it because my area is health informatics, okay? So, so I moved to that, why? Because I saw that there would be lots of money in EU about the Green Deal, I said, okay, now is the opportunity to start, you know, but not as a lead investor, you know, with someone that's a lead investor. So I saw also the same thing with the European Business Angel Network that we see each other and we discuss and we have some friends here now. Also that they have done this, FinTech, okay, we heard that earlier, Agro and so on. So usually some of the people of our members also of uh, European Business Angel, they shifted to this. They try to be selective also to investments because they want to do a follow-up, you know, that's an, an issue. It's not that you give the, the pre-seed or seed money, you have to follow up on this. So you have to pick, put some reserve. The issue that we had was with the companies that there were less than 10 people. Mm. Because the runaway came, you know, closer. We usually invest for 12 months, that came to six months. So we had issues with those ones that we had to give more money, you know, to take them to the next, you know, 10 miles, as, well, as I say, okay? So there is... You change your criteria, as we have criteria for startups, which ones are ready to invest. We have to change also our criteria during to this, but that's the challenge and that's the beauty and also an opportunity. Okay, we change your criteria regarding, you know, to be selective, having, you know, sector, you know, you go to sectors that you see promising things, and also by having enough money in order to follow up, you know, to investments to keep the people that you know for many years and trust is there. Because as you know, even to go for a co-investment together, we have to trust each other. Syndicates, they will not happen if you don't trust each other, okay? So this is the issues that we have to consider, but I think there are solutions by discussing, by having, you know, communication with others, and then if we have, you know, people say, okay, let's go this way, then we have to take the risk and go. So you mentioned a very important point on investing human to human, right? Which means if you are human to the people that you are investing in, you will often become the first phone call they make in times of trouble. So all of a sudden you have an entire portfolio of companies that you call, as, uh, who call you as soon as something goes wrong, right? But you have some dry powder saved specifically for this situation. Who do you give money to, to protect value? and who do you let go? Yeah, that's a good question, and also sometimes we're human, so emotions are there, are there okay? And this is the, the, the bad thing. 
Uh, of course, we should have partly the emotions. I'm not 100%, take 100% out your emotions because then I don't think we have sustainable founders, sustainable entrepreneurs. That's another thing. We talk about sustainability, but we need to build, and also, you know, the VCs and us, we must be responsible investors, and also we should create responsible entrepreneurs. And why this? Because this, as everybody talks about the CO2, but CO2 also is my name and my last name, my first name, because you will say, okay, Panos is a guy, great guy, you know, to do business, or I'm not a good guy to do a business. So, which one you let go is the people that they are not looking very much, usually even if even I'm an investor, usually I say, as we heard here to the founders, your best investor is your customers. So if they don't see unit economics one, two, three times, then I let them go. Because I don't have the time, you know, I have in my portfolio so many kids, you know, or marriages with a specific date of divorce, as we say, okay? And I have to keep them, you know, happy, giving them time, okay? Uh, so I, I let them go if they don't understand basic. My issue, and I think I heard this from many other colleagues from the European, Founders sometimes they don't understand basic finance that, and this is something that we need also to tell them you know to discuss with them or train them about this because they come with some numbers that they're you know they don't make sense at all and it's not a criticism you know but also I say the criticism to us that we have from the beginning to tell them what is the right finance you know and talk you know talk the right language because they come from a background engineers they're great engineers but they don't understand basic finance so we, we let go if people you know they don't understand the basic you know unit economics makes a lot of sense did you care to yeah uh, i think we should uh, you know talk to them um, and try to figure out which ones of them uh, do have a chance. Remember, in terms of turmoil, they are not only the ones who are suffering, also their competition is suffering. So the, uh, the, whole, um, uh, the whole area in which they are playing, the playing field, is a dynamic thing that is changing. So we need to give them uh, at least another chance. And uh, maybe this takes me back to one of the questions that we are talking about, whether uh, to run after growth um, blindly and burn cash blindly uh, just to get market share. This is something that needs to be assessed as well. Uh, whether that kind of burning and that kind of growth will in the end show me a path to profitability or not. Because when we go to a later stage, they actually start pricing profitability. And I think profitability at the end of the tunnel is the name of the game or else uh, there is no uh, reason for that company to exist five, 10 years from now. And without pro uh, a, a future uh, cash flow that we can, uh, you know, okay, we can try to look for a present value for, there won't be a value for that company. Minush, in a world where not everyone gets follow-on funding. Cash is king. Cash is very, very scarce. There is a tremendous opportunity for distressed asset investors, especially in the market today. In our local market, there are a number of companies that are strapped for cash. They are trading at deeply depressed valuations, uh, and you could get a phenomenal deal. But we're not really seeing any distressed asset investors. We're not seeing any capital um, go to these particular companies, what can we do to encourage some of these players to come into the market? Well, it's, it's actually um, dist distressed um, investments as an asset class exists elsewhere because from a regulatory point of view, it can exist. You can, you can buy debt from the banks. Uh, you can buy non-performing loans. Uh, bankruptcy laws are much clearer. We, this, I mean, Egypt is still not there yet. Um, the second point is also private debt exists at a much larger scale. Private uh, uh, debt with different risk appetites. So also exists in terms of um, different levels of funds um, um, that can that can address distress assets as, um, as an investment class. 
this doesn't exist really in Egypt. And I think also um, our, it's not really in our culture to build on um, or make money out of companies in distress. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with, uh, wrong with it, but it's, I mean, I think there has been several attempts, uh, not highly appreciated, um, and we, ha we don't really accept the concept that a company that has gone into distress uh, needs to be really charged very high and expensive follow-on, whether capital or uh, debt, and it, and it can also involve a lot of stripping of the assets. This concept is not really acceptable, uh, possibly from a cultural point of view, religious point of view, I don't know, but there's been several attempts that were not very successful. From locally from Egypt and also um, uh, several um, investments that came from abroad. But um, I think there's a lot of room for turnaround funds rather than distressed assets. Funds that can go in, work with the companies, work with the management, bring in new management and turn around these companies, restructure balance sheet, uh, um, do some, some, some asset stripping, uh, but not as aggressive as you, you see it elsewhere globally. Um, again, not very successful in Egypt because it's also very much linked to valuation. Um, I think with the new bankruptcy law, things should start changing and possibly we could see a couple of turnaround funds that can be uh, incorporated in the next couple of years. So you and I have been on several panels where we talk about the disconnect between venture capital and private equity, and sometimes core to that is, is valuation, how people think about investing in this asset class versus that asset class. Okay. There are companies in the market today that have taken a huge haircut on valuation. They are out there trying to get capital from private equity. Finally, they're in a, something that makes sense for private equity. You Nobody, can give no them my biting. business card. I haven't seen these companies. <laughs> so. I, can I can introduce you to 16 of them. <laughs> okay. Six months ago, they were, the, okay. the, the, they were darlings of the okay. ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. They were raising money at 100, 200, 300 million dollar valuations. Many of their deals have fallen through. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them will, will take, take that money at 50 or $60 million now instead of 200. But money is not going there. Private equity money, are they cash flow positive? Is there an EBITDA or not well, It's yet. a very specific question that I have to not, get into the companies. Not yet. But they were poster childs okay. of the technology industry. Not necessarily poster childs of the private equity industry. So, so how do we bridge that gap? You talk. I think I think that uh, private equity and venture capital need to need to have channels of communication like we're doing today. We need to have that talk. It, we're we're not doing it consciously, uh, and then there is still a disconnect because we look at financial statements, we look at business plans from a completely different point of view. We also look at entrepreneurs and founders from a different point of view, and and. Um, Sometimes we don't even understand each other. We have different uh, um, jargons, we have different lingo, but we should be talking more. Um, I think as the ecosystem develops, this, this is gonna start happening. And, and, and there's a couple of deals on the market that where this actually happened, it was possibly different times and at completely different valuations. I think, um, uh, the valuations that the market has seen over the course of the past couple of years has deterred private equity to to make that connection because we have never seen and we can, I don't think we can accept these kind of uh, of values specifically to companies that have not yet reached that level of profitability because for us it's about profitability it's about cash flow positive companies it's about margins and it's about growth capital to enhance the margins, but not to invest when the margin is not there yet. So um, I think as things start changing, perhaps there is a lot of opportunity for this connection and for this dialogue to start. Fantastic. 
Uh, Amar, we've, we've talked about risk management from the perspective of companies, a little bit from the perspective of um, uh, investing in early stage, later stage. As a fund manager, right, uh, I need to think about how I would diversify my portfolio or how I would diversify a hundred million dollar fund in a, in, a time, in a time like that. For the fund managers out here, most, of, most folks in this room are fund managers. Um, how would we think about these funds with the vintage of today that have high potential? How do I continue to manage my risk over the next two or three years? If the question is about diversification, it comes uh, in very different flavors, uh, in many different flavors. I mean, we can diversify the different sectors, we can diversify the stage of investment, we can diversify the uh, market in which they are uh, in, uh, playing in, uh, we can look at um, uh, different uh, management styles. Um, I mean, diversification is, is, is important because uh, if, uh, it's very simply uh, put, if a company uh, does badly, uh, other companies in the portfolio will be able to carry me. Uh, so uh, looking at it, uh, you can also diversify in terms of uh, revenue stream and uh, the um, different currencies in which that revenue uh, comes in. So diversification is, is is actually not that difficult when you think about it, if you have a focus on uh, doing that. Because those who put all their eggs in one basket will end up with a catastrophe, as we all know. I think this is a very uh, simple and basic uh, exercise. I want to give space, uh, if anybody has any questions, we've got maybe a couple minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any questions for, for the panelists? All right, everybody solid on managing risk? Okay, there we go. Uh, this is for Manoush. You're talking about uh, cultural challenges in Egypt to distressed assets in that Could you elaborate more for a non I think culturally, uh, culturally um, we um, it's expected of us to support people in distress. So it's, it's something that's not really accepted to benefit from a company or an individual or shareholders that, uh, that have gone into distress. So that's from a cultural point of view. But it's not the only uh, reason why distressed funds are not really heavily operated and, and, and present in Egypt. We have a lot of other legal and regulatory issues uh, that have not supported a framework for distressed funds to operate here. But that's just my own analysis. I might be wrong, but... Is there, of course there's a market for it. I think that the statistics is that with the 2016 devaluation, possibly with the one that we just witnessed two weeks ago, there's thousands of companies and manufacturing facilities that have completely either halted operation, um, uh, considered um, uh, in distress, they cannot uh, get any additional funding from banks. So we do have a huge market for it. and and. It's, it seems that you're considering doing that. <laughs> you want to start a distressed fund here? Okay. There's, uh, I'll, I'll give you two, uh, two success stories that I'm aware of that are part distressed, part uh, turnaround that are worth looking at. And they're both in the FMB space. Number one is a company called Corona, which is a chocolate manufacturer. And the other company is called Biscomas, yeah. uh, which is also very, so these two case studies are actually really, really interesting. And uh, if you're interested in, in some of the, what, I, what I'd like to call legacy Egyptian businesses, these are two really, really interesting stories that are worth poking around in. But they were not distressed. These were turnarounds. These exactly. were not companies so, in distress. Yeah. yeah. So is that just a terminology then? Well, okay. So if you, the technical term for a distressed asset is very different than a turnaround, but in the context of a market like here, it's just companies that are maybe not doing so well and could be doing better, right? So that's maybe the, the, the easier framing, but if I really want to get into distressed, asset, distressed assets and debt, it becomes a very different conversation. But if you think about it as a company that has potential that 
isn't doing as well as it could be, that works much better. All right, risk. I think we won uh, this panel. Well done, everyone. Thank you so much for being, uh, having you, this sir. conversation with me. Thank you.